events of today, uh, I'm sure, uh, preoccupy much of our thoughts and uh, uh, cast a certain, uh, what, uh, what they cast, but something over, over what we have to say and to consider here. I think that the story of the city may be the most extraordinary part of the remarkable story of man and in many ways the most faithful. The city has been both the patron and protector of the greatest achievements of the human spirit. It has also been frequently an instrument or a source of decadence and decay. We might almost say that it is only in the city that man emerges into history, and uh, it is that city which, again, uh, becomes often his undoing. Man's noblest monuments adorn the world's greatest cities. At the same time, sord sordidness and squalor and vice disfigure those cities. If man is, as uh, many feel, a mixture of good and evil, of on the one hand soaring vision and on the other petty greed, of public spiritedness and of ostentatious luxury, the city is the concrete and dramatic representation of that nature. So our image of the city, I suggest, is profoundly ambiguous. In every age, the city has had both its champions and its enemies, those who loved it and those who feared it, and as Keith Berwick suggested, often they, these were combined in the same person. Thomas Jefferson loved Paris with all his heart, yet he feared the growth of cities in his beloved America and wished to do all that he could to discourage their, uh, their rise. Lewis Mumford in his City in History has expressed some of the contradictions that lie in that ambiguous image. Will the city disappear, he asks, or will the whole planet turn into a vast urban hive? Can the needs and desires that have impelled men to live in cities recover at a higher level all that Jerusalem, Athens, or Florence once seemed to promise? Well, I think these questions have a particular urgency for us here in Southern California, as Keith Berwick suggested, or more specifically in greater Los Angeles. This is one of the great population centers of the world, doubtless the richest population center in the world, and uh, the question of whether it will become in time a great city or a necropolis, like so many of the urban centers that have preceded it, will depend, of course, in a very large part barring nuclear annihilation on the zeal and public spiritedness of its citizens. Whether a civic sense strong enough or wise enough can be evoked in this great sprawling uh, metropolis to give a human shape to a growth that some of, to some of its critics seems cancerous uh, is, is, I suppose, uh, the most urgent problem that, uh, that confronts us. No city in the world has a greater material and human potential. And I think, on the other hand, few cities present a more depressing picture of chaotic and unplanned growth. We are not yet a community. Uh, we uh, are rather a monument to individualism uh, and to uh, personal uh, interest and uh, often avarice run wild. Well, what uh, about the history of the city? Of course, here we can give only the most foreshortened notion of it. I could again quote Lewis Mumford's observation that without a long-running start in history, we shall not have the momentum needed in our own consciousness to take a sufficiently bold leap into the future. Of course, it seems to me that is the reason we study history and are concerned with it at all, is that by looking back, we get momentum enough to take a, the kind of leap into the future that man must always take if his society is to endure. Tonight we can only take a very short running start, you might say a 60-yard dash as opposed to Mr. Mumford's marathon run. The origins of the city are certainly hidden in the mids, mists of prehistory. It's one of historians and anthropologists, archaeologists, principal uh, activities speculating about the character of, of uh, that origin, about its nature. 
Through archaeology, we are able to make certain guesses about its origin. It certainly came well after the appearance of settled agricultural life. Its origin was apparently more sacred than practical. It did not appear initially as a practical response to environment, to trading opportunities, to the requirements of defense. It was one indeed, apparently, of those many developments in history which cannot be accounted for on any simple causal basis. This is always the temptation, I think, the vanity of historians to believe that we can account for the extraordinary unfolding of history by uh, means of, of a clearly linked set of, of causal, uh, causal uh, events or developments. It was created, I think, quite clearly by man's imagination, by a kind of leap in being. It was an effort to represent in human social form the great cosmic order. The imperatives were divine rather than human. This was a new symbolic world that the city represented, and the temple uh, stood at its heart. The city included within its walls all uh, and within its sacred order all those who could find uh, a place. Uh, this was true of the ancient city of Sumer, of the cities of Egypt, and it's uh, true also in one of the great unsolved puzzle puzzles of history, the Mayan cities of the New World. Well, people drawn together into urban uh, communities discovered new powers and were subject to new corruptions. Art that rose above the level of folk art flourished in the city. The elaboration of ritual and of liturgy, uh, theology, uh, these things also marked the city dweller, uh, a self-consciousness unknown to the rural uh, laborer also appeared. The city looked to the heavens for a model of the divine order. The organization of power, or look for it as the source of which the city was the model. The organization of power in the city followed with the king as representative of the divine, and he began to surround himself with those instruments of power, uh, armies, bureaucracies, which were to become the standard support of kingship throughout history. War uh, very soon became one of the principal reasons for the city's existence. Uh, it uh, thrust out and made war on its, uh, on its neighbors, on other cities. It, it was attracted by the promise of spoil, and it also became an object of, of uh, greed and envy, and uh, was in turn uh, attacked and despoiled. Aside from these uh, from the uh, warfare, which was uh, uh, in most uh, uh, societies, early societies, chronic, uh, the city did, as I suggest, give a sense to the people who were part of it, a sense of power, a security, a sense of significance, of being uh, directly related to a larger order. Again, we might uh, quote Mumford, uh, speaking of the inner life of the city as it expanded. Dreams welled up out of the interior and took form. Fantasies turned into drama. Sexual desire flowered into poetry and dance and music. Exploitation, which the city made possible, permitted at the same time the appearance of a class of artists and patrons as well as artisans. And so you get a differentiation uh, division of labor, which is one of the classic aspects of urban life and uh, ultimately of our uh, modern industrial society. In the sexual area, the appearance of the prostitute was symbolic. In the oldest uh, Sumerian text, we are told that Gilgamesh called uh, together the craftsmen and the warriors, while Ishtar assembled the pleasure girls and the temple harlots. Here we might say was the beginning of that special relation to the city, of the city to man's sexual drives, turning them on the one hand into sensitive expressions of art and on the other uh, uh, using false stimulation and uh, drawing them into uh, various forms of perversion. We might call the beginning of urban life in some ways the beginning of man's dividedness, a kind of early or the early or the original fall. 
Certainly this notion is strong in biblical literature. The Jews, who were a nomadic and agricultural people, struggled against the power and the menace, the distractions and the perversions of the city. We have in Genesis the dramatic story of the cities of the plain, an enduring uh, symbol of the wickedness of cities. In Sodom and Gomorrah, you'll recall, the Lord could not find one righteous man. You remember that extraordinarily poignant dialogue between Lot and the Lord over the, over the fate of the, of the cities of the plain. The city dweller sacrificed for the sense of being in the center of the earthly representation of the cosmic order, the wholeness, and the simplicity of village life. He freed himself of the tribe, the family, and the clan, and became a member of a community made up of sharply differentiated individuals, fr graded from the slave who appeared early in the city and remained for a long time a conspicuous element in it, to the, uh, to the great king, the symbol of power uh, at its apex. Only at the top of the city was there, uh, in the upper class, uh, classes of the city, was there real freedom, uh, real choice, real autonomy. But those beneath learned to share vicariously in the symbolic power uh, of the king. Life in the city also took on a far greater drama than country existence. It's necessary, of course, to point out that the character of cities varied. It was as different as the cultures of which they were usually the principal manif manifestations. Egypt, the cities of Egypt, differed from those of Sumer. The Greek city-states from, uh, from Minos on Crete and so on throughout the early period of uh, the history of cities. I suppose we have our most uh, uh, appealing uh, figure, images of cities from uh, the classical times of Greece and Rome, uh, the Greek city of which Athens is the archetype where the name of citizen, the functions of a citizen, uh, the role of a citizen appeared in a kind of uh, dignity and splendor that has uh, seldom, if ever, been uh, surpassed. Uh, again, uh, the, the uh, participation of the citizen in the life of his community, uh, of his city, and the whole uh, idea of citizenship, the, the very word uh, implying a state of cultivation and civilization. And again on in the uh, history of uh, Rome, uh, of the Roman Empire, uh, the eternal city of Rome, again representing many things, but preeminently the exaltation of this idea of citizenship, uh, making, making this the proudest, uh, the proudest uh, uh, title in the ancient world. After the fall of Rome, a whole new chapter began in the life of cities. The church represented a unifying principle and it allowed a wide dispersion in agricultural communities. Cities virtually disappeared. They were no longer needed to represent the cosmic order. That was represented in the church. So this meant a, a dispersion and a kind of regrouping, you might say, the discovery of new potentialities and the development of cities in new ways. Through the Middle Ages and the early, and early modern times, the cities of the Western world were slowly constructed and some reconstructed on the, on the foundations of ancient cities. They had many different origins. There were fortress towns, there were Episcopal seats, there were market towns, administrative centers. Uh, these were the principal forms, but again, uh, there were many variations. Each of these general types might have one of a number of different relations to an external power, to a king or to a great landlord. Some were collections of renters with money to spend and a demand for various services. Max Weber uh, distinguishes between the producer city and the consumer city. The city of the renters was, uh, was the latter type, the, the consumer city. The producer city, uh, we could take uh, as uh, being represented by the lowland wool manufacturings of uh, manufacturing towns of the Duchy of Brabant. 
The existence of market towns depended, of course, on favorable geographical factors, on a transportation break which the, which the uh, city could uh, bridge or serve. Uh, it depended on encouragement by a prince or lord in the form of particular concessions or guarantees. The, the lord, uh, the uh, seigneur or landlord, was usually interested in a regular supply of foreign articles in tolls and in taxes. One of the most important features of the new emerging, emergent or emerging city uh, in uh, medieval uh, times was the absence of castes that were ratified by religious dogmas, as in India. The city thus from the first had a communal character. Weber takes the example of St. Peter administering the communion meal to the uncircumcised brethren as an example of this Catholicity, this instinct to draw all into the community and make them a part of it. You could say thus that from the beginning Christianity influenced the character of the town in indirect ways as well as direct ways. There was never a ritualistic exclusiveness established in, in such communities. And the tendency that we find always in towns, in, in uh, urban uh, centers, the te tendency to social stratification was balanced by this sense of community. Uh, many cities were originally confederations of individual burghers. The city of the medieval Occident, Weber says, was economically a seat of trade and commerce, politically a fortress and a garrison, administratively a court district, and socially an oath-bound confederation. And Weber puts considerable emphasis on this latter point, on the idea of the oath-bound confederation, which he calls the conjurato. The initial aim was the union of resident landowners for offensive and defensive purposes, for the peaceable settlement of internal disputes, for the safeguarding of administrative procedures. I don't suppose it's too far-fetched to see between uh, this corporate character of the town uh, and the later ideas of John Locke, a, an important connection, because certainly the idea of contract, of contractual relationship as the idea of community has a very important uh, political history uh, as it's drawn into a somewhat uh, different context and thus given a different meaning and different direction. Once members of, uh, established members of the community drawn together to were drawn together to combine their powers against powerful landlords and princes, they were able to bargain for particular rights and privileges. Indeed, uh, they could buy them outright, and these became the cherished principles of citizenship in particular communities. They thus freed themselves, the growing towns, uh, quite rapidly of the feudal obligations that their less fortunate rural uh, brothers endured uh, for uh, several centuries later. They wanted to make justice rational and orderly and predictable. A merchant couldn't carry on business if he was to be called on uh, to respond to some kind of, of uh, uh, test by battle to decide a disputed legal point. So he thus had a particular uh, imperative or particular uh, motivation uh, to uh, try to help develop a system, a rational and uh, predictable system uh, of law. The rural community was often satisfied if what law it had conformed to common sense or even if the law was as irrational as proof by duel, uh, but this was impossible for the city dueller to put up with for the burgher or the merchant. He wanted codification of the laws in order to, be, to know where he stood and to be able to plan in some intelligent way uh, his commercial activity. So we could say that the city, this kind of city, with many uh, ramifications that we have no time to uh, give our attention to, uh, ushered Western man into the modern world. An important aspect of the cities, of course, were the guilds, a form of corporate activity even older than the oath-bound groups, created 
these which created a, a separate center of power in the city and in their own way uh, strengthened both the corporate life and the bonds of community. We must remember certainly here when we talk about these cities that they grew up long before the development of the modern city-state and thus they were far more important individually than the modern city-state or the modern city. Uh, they became semi-autonomous, many of them. Uh, they had their own laws and their own privileges, jealously maintained, and we find their historic residues in uh, such uh, cities as Monaco uh, and San Marco today. Monaco uh, uh, having its dispute with, uh, with General de Gaulle over, uh, over paying taxes, which has been recently in the papers. The city-states of Italy were, of course, another type of city of vast importance in this, in this period. Those of, of Brabant, the lowlands, another. Uh, the Italian city-states were in a chronic uh, condition of instability, but perhaps as a consequence of this, they enjoyed a hothouse growth in their cultural uh, and intellectual life. Well, again, this is a story that we can only uh, allude to in passing. The development of the modern nation state in the 16th and 17th century gave an impetus to the growth of cities while it changed their character and their relationship to each other and to uh, the particular centers of authority. Uh, there, was, there followed an expansion of trade, an increase in circulating medium, uh, which goes back or is related to the opening of the uh, silver mines of Bohemia and the discovery of the great resources of gold and silver uh, in the Spanish New World. All of these things stimulated and encouraged the growth of cities while, as I say, it changed their direction. It oriented them more toward the uh, individualistic mercantile activity than toward corporate mercantile activity, but it resulted in almost incredible expansion. It's hard to realize how recent the growth and expansion uh, of cities is. In 1800, no city in the Western world had over a million people. London was the largest city uh, with some uh, 960,000. Paris had half a million. By 1850, London had more than two million people and Paris over a million. In 1900, there were 11 cities in the Western world of more than a million population, three of them in New York, uh, in the uh, United States, uh, New York, uh, Chicago, uh, and Philadelphia. In 1930, there were 27 cities with more than a million inhabitants. And this is a, only the part of the story. We're concentrating here only on the huge metropolises. It's well to note that there was an equally uh, spectacular rise in cities with populations of more than 100,000. Well over half of our population today lives within, the radius of, within a radius of 20 miles of cities of over 100,000 population. Uh, the world population, which lived in cities of over 100,000 uh, or 100,000 or over, was 1.7% 1 in 1800 and 13.1% in 1950. So I think that gives you a notion in 150 years of the uh, perfectly extraordinary growth of cities and the degree in which they, to which they have drawn into their uh, confines uh, uh, great <coughs> portions of the population that once were rural. The new cities, needless to say, particularly the new cities of the New World, uh, differed from the old. They were not as self-contained and indeed not self-contained at all. They were not autonomous. They were not as sharply individualized as the old cities. They did not manifest the same richness of art, the same expressiveness. We might uh, contrast Venice with Chicago, a Chicago, a classic city of the new world, new city of the new world, uh, uh, lacking the, the grace and beauty that distinguished uh, many old world cities. Cities in America had from the start a special story, I think. Uh, they had to begin, they had to start from scratch. Uh, they were usually 
unlovely, graceless accumulations of hastily built buildings. They were in the process of constant change. In every generation, you could say there was a new city, and sometimes in less than a generation. Think of the transformation in Los Angeles in 20 years or 25 years. Is it the same city? Uh, only in the roughest, uh, in the roughest sense. It uh, rests in the same general geographic area. In 1800, it was true that perhaps as much as 90% of Americans were uh, rural, uh, agricultural, lived in small agricultural communities. As the cities began to grow and to occupy a more and more prominent place in uh, American society, there was growing resentment uh, directed toward them. Uh, they were seen as centers of industrialism, and uh, they seemed also to reveal the most exploitive aspects of capitalism. The, physio the physiocrats in France celebrated the natural man, the simple farmer, the uncorrupted rustic. They maintained that all wealth originated in the land, that industry and commerce were essentially sterile and could not add to the wealth created by the land. They were charmed as a consequence by America. It seemed to them a perfect setting for their theories, a land uncorrupted by cities and by industry. Many Americans, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams among them, were most receptive to such ideas. They believed, and many uh, believed with them, that the man who lived close to the soil was a better, wiser, more virtuous man than the city dweller. And Jefferson gave the classic statement of this proposition, those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God, if ever he had a chosen people, whose breasts he has made his peculiar deposit for substantial and genuine virtue. It is the focus in which he keeps alive that sacred fire which might otherwise escape from the face of the earth. Uh, this idea had gotten an earlier expression of the particular virtue and excellence of the farmer in the letters, uh, in Crevcourt's letters of an American farmer. We find it again and again. I could quote uh, a hundred uh, curious and engaging uh, examples. Here is one. Take a hundred plowmen promiscuously from their fields and a hundred merchants from their desks and what regarding the true dignity uh, what man regarding the true dignity of his nature could hesitate to give the award of superior excellence in every main intellectual, physical, and moral respect to the band of hardy rustics over that of the lank and sallow accountants worn out with the sordid anxieties of traffic and the calculation of gain. And then it goes on to speak with considerable bitterness, this uh, uh, Jacksonian editor, of the merchant who grows rich uh, through his participation in, in the unequal privileges which a false system of legislation has created, while the plowman, unprotected by the laws and dependent wholly on himself, shall barely earn a frugal livelihood uh, by continued toil. The yeoman farmer was the ideal American type, the city dweller, the immigrant, they were to be feared and, and uh, to be suspect. Uh, Frederick Jackson Turner renewed this image in the picture of the frontiersman who is Jefferson's yeoman farmer uh, brought up to date, up to mid-19th up to mid, uh, uh, century date in any event, and the populace drew on this, on this same myth. And of course the vast majority of Americans, being farmers themselves, were pleased and flattered by the, uh, the image that had been presented perhaps originally by the physiocrats and then polished and burnished by successive uh, generations of Americans. So I would say that Americans to a remarkable degree kept their eyes fixed on this ideal while the greatest urban industrial society in history was growing like a mushroom. And the ideal is not dead by any means. Uh, in, uh, uh, in not very long ago, uh, uh, Pitrim Sorokin and Carl Zimmerman, two outstanding uh, sociologists, uh, in a pioneering book uh, entitled The Principles of Rural Urban Sociology, uh, described the life of the city 
very much as uh, in more sophisticated terms, but very much as Thomas Jefferson uh, or one of his uh, followers would have done uh, 150 years earlier. To Sorokin, the cultivator is exposed to the weather and the climatic conditions, breathes cleaner and fresher air, that God knows there is no doubt, is in much greater proximity to and in the more, more direct relation with nature, soil, flora, fauna, water, river, the sun, the moon, the sky, the wind, the rain, and so on, than the urbanite. The urbanite is urban dweller is separated from all this by thick walls of vast and huge buildings and the artificial city environment of predominantly stone and iron. Not a free wind refreshes him, but a draft of the electric fan. Not the sunlight, but the artificial gas or electric light greets his eyes. Not the soil, but a pavement is found beneath his feet. The miracles and mysteries of nature are seen primarily in movies, theaters, from the pictures in his papers, and only once in a while on a picnic. And so then, of course, from this follows the inevitably the superiority of the country life to the city life, the superiority of country virtue, of course, Sorokin is too sophisticated to use such an archaic word, but that's what he means, of country virtue uh, to, uh, to city virtue. The rural dweller is both healthier and happier than his urban counterpart, has, uh, this is Sorokin, greater forcefulness, vitality, love for, or satisfaction with life. The city dweller is a free thinker, an open-minded anti-traditionalist, who scoffs at religion and at values in general and recognizes no duties or obligations to his fellows who are strangers. The farmer, on the other hand, shows greater stability, simplicity, idealism, religiosity, dogmatism, and has generally what might be styled as a greater peace of mind. He is stronger than his city cousin in virility, sternness, austerity, patience, endurance, and the ability for continued effort. And then they go on to, uh, Sorokin uh, elaborates this already rather overdrawn picture, and then he says that the city dweller without friends or a purpose in life commits suicide either quietly or with curses at the injustice of the world. So I don't know who's left to populate the cities. Uh, uh, the city dweller uh, seems destined to make uh, make an end of himself when he contemplates the, uh, the, the miserable existence that he leads. Well, as I say, this Mr. Sorokin is still one of our most distinguished living uh, sociologists. I haven't uh, quizzed him whether he's uh, relented in his attitude toward the city, uh, but uh, here is a contemporary, a, a contemporary statement of this same, of this same attitude. So I think we can say that Americans uh, walked backward into the urban age with their eyes fixed on the ideal of rural purity. And this is one of many paradoxes in American history. Americans have not been inclined to face the implications of what it meant to become a great urban industrial city, what it meant to those values which they lauded and which they professed to uh, abide by and model their lives on. American cities have had a dreary sameness of origin. All of them are commercial and industrial. They have lacked communal forms and a real corporate life. They have lacked rituals and ceremonials to dignify the common life. Uh, we see there, in many instances, the cash nexus at its most naked and ungraceful. We feel an absence, a lack of festival and celebration. The city is almost from its beginning a scene of uh, an area of alienation and of anonymousness. The role of women in the city is one of particular interest and one which again had we time might well uh, take uh, occupy a good deal of it. I would argue that women in the city suffered a constant erosion of their position. They were important in an agricultural community. Uh, there was no questioning their uh, their uh, usefulness, their direct relation to the economy of the farm. Uh, in the city it was quite different. The man went away to do the important thing, to make the money that would sustain the family. He was engaged in some remote and mysterious ritual. He came home with the money and the home was the place where the money was uh, to be sure spent or, or displayed. 
but uh, the wife no longer had this intimate connection that she had uh, in the family economy uh, uh, as she had had uh, in, the, in the rural community. So I think that we can say fairly certainly that the woman in America uh, enjoyed initially considerable importance and, uh, and respect and lost it progressively as, the, as she moved into the city, as, the, as our society became increasingly urbanized, and then had to struggle to get it back. So that uh, in this struggle, of course, uh, there, was a, uh, there is some question about what she succeeded in getting back and, and uh, uh, what use it is to her if she has gotten it back. I mean, we have, obviously, as one of the great themes of our culture, the ambiguous position of American women in our society. What is she, wife, mother, uh, worker, uh, and companion, so on. I mean, what, what, how shall she select and play her proper role? In the city, the woman is very often uh, for the uh, upper middle class, middle class community, an adornment. Uh, this is, she is one of the ways in which we, in which the wealthy and successful male can demonstrate his wealth and success by, by uh, adorning his wife and, and uh, placing her in a Cadillac and so on. Uh, all that uh, uh, can manifest uh, uh, his, his accomplishment, his power, his uh, achievement, his virility, uh, and so on. But what is it, whether it's the best thing for the woman is something, is something else again. From the beginning, American cities played a very critical role, an essential role, in inducting vast numbers of immigrants into American society. As these immigrants collected in ghettos, they at least preserved some community life, the customs and traditions that they brought with them from the old world. Much of the history of American cities of the East particularly and to a lesser degree of the Midwest can be read in the light of this particular problem and the reaction of the native community to it. We know well the role of the city boss who depended upon an immigrant constituency and who often uh, used them for his own corrupt purposes. We know the dismayed reaction of the native population culminating in the drastic restriction of immigration. It's hard sometimes to realize how vital and important a role, how fundamental a role these immigrants played in the history of the respective cities where they, where they found their temporary or permanent homes. We've seen them primarily as the dupes of the bosses. But the fact is that each generation of immigrants cared more for the ideals of the Declaration of Independence than did the natives. And they managed to renew each generation the ideals of the founders in all their original force and vitality. And that is more important than uh, their manipulation by, by city bosses who did serve by manipulating them to act as a buffer between them and the harsh reality of, a, of an alien city. American cities were moreover without feudal and late feudal residues and this meant a great acceleration of technological change uh, uh, they didn't have to contend with entrenched corporate groups who uh, had particular vested interests to protect. Uh, they simply, the cities could simply grow in response to their own uh, particular uh, needs and uh, potentialities, which were uh, overwhelmingly, uh, indeed I think we can say exclusively, uh, commercial and industrial. Uh, there was nothing uh, to, or little or nothing to impede them. And of course we find this true uh, today even when we contrast a, a uh, western city like a new city like Los Angeles with an old city like Philadelphia or Boston. We see how much more rapidly some new development, uh, whether in technology or elsewhere, uh, burgeons and grows here than in uh, the older and more resistant environment. Well, the ambiguity of the city then continued in uh, American history, in the American story, but it expressed itself in new ways. Uh, I've spoken of the dismay of the uh, native population over the influx of immigrants. Uh, 
uh, we perhaps don't recall or would perhaps rather not recall uh, that uh, such ideas were put forward as the forcible forceful sterilization of undesirable minority groups so that uh, American society would not be corrupted or polluted by their offspring. Uh, so great were the uh, anxieties, and they centered often on the cities, since it was the city in which the immigrant, in which the immigrant was most clearly visible. Well, uh, into this picture of chaotic and random growth, or reacting to it, uh, we began to get uh, well, we had several things. I suppose the first reaction, and in some ways the most touching reaction, uh, most dramatic reaction, was that of those was the reaction of those people who established utopian communities. There were a great many utopian communities established in 19th century America, and most of them uh, were established as a protest against the growth of cities and the destruction of communities, the absorption the disappearance, the disruption of, of uh, rural community and small town life by, by the growing uh, urban uh, centers. So later then, if this was an earlier and doomed uh, reaction to or protest against the city and the things that it did to misshape and deform life, uh, the later uh, impulse or later uh, resistance was expressed uh, in, in the cult, I think we could call it, of city planning, which to be sure went back to, had its relationship and antecedents in uh, these earlier utopian efforts, uh, more, uh, more particularly that of Robert Dale Owen, who planned a, a uh, uh, bright and clean community for his own workers early in the 19th century. So you had the rise of city planning, and again, we can see some of the consequences of this. It was haphazard, it was disorganized, it had to depend everywhere, not on some central uh, action or central authority, but on local initiative, and since local initiative varied uh, widely, uh, the, the uh, character of city planning varied. This is an area in which I'm not, I hasten to say, since I understand the audience is liberally seated with city planners, uh, not I'm even less confident than I am in the other areas in which I'm speaking. But you had uh, certainly this as an important appearance. This is an important aspect then of the city. Uh, the, the model housing project is familiar to us all, if not conspicuous in this area. And again, oddly enough, the results, the consequences of this uh, city planning effort carried on by men of great goodwill and intelligence and earnestness seem suddenly uh, as ambiguous as, the, as any other aspect of the city. We have, you have in your reading list a reference to the book of, by, by Jane Jacobs uh, in which she questions very seriously whether the modern hygienic... Uh, housing development is indeed a proper place for human beings. The fact is that it has bred uh, crime and violence in many places where, where such uh, projects have been, been built. And Jane Jacobs calls us to a new sympathy for the bustle and noise and human warmth and dirt and disorder and healthy confusion of the neighborhood. She has described the advantages quite, quite eloquently, perhaps romantically, of the old neighborhood over the new glass and concrete housing development, cold and impersonal, which has replaced the intimacy uh, and neighborliness of the slum area. Perhaps this is romanticism. She speaks, uh, though, she, since she writes well, she has the power to evoke a very appealing picture of this kind of uh, neighborhood, which was often a, a foreign-born ghetto of a kind. And of course, we find even in our literature, interestingly enough, and, and perhaps uh, Mr. Kessler will have something to say about this later, the appearance of uh, novels that give us a, a very sympathetic and, and warm picture of the, of the uh, character of life in foreign-born uh, neighborhoods in our large in our large cities. 
Lewis Mumford is the most eloquent voice of the planners, and as your, as your uh, little bibliography tells, tells you, uh, much of Jane Jacobs' fire is directed a, a, against him. It's worth noting that he takes Los Angeles as the classic and horrible example of the modern city at its worst, certainly in terms of land utilization and of intelligent concern for a wholesome and humane community. He has some illustrations, uh, horror pictures in his, uh, in his uh, book of the freeway system of Los Angeles and aerial photographs showing the, uh, uh, the uh, portion of our city now devoted to uh, taking care of automobiles, what he calls uh, mono-transportation, I think that's his name for the, for the individually owned and driven automobile, which of course seems to him, as I confess it often seems to me, the particular enemy of, of uh, uh, modern man. It's interesting to note in passing uh, again here that, that uh, Mumford takes Berkeley, uh, the University of California as, at Berkeley, as an ideal university community. He gives us a picture of it and then discusses it and adds this. If the university is to function as the organizing nucleus in the new urban implosion, it must not merely decentralize and reorganize its facilities on a regional basis. And I might stop and say here parenthetically, of course, that this is very much what this university has been doing, and which I know its chancellor intends that it shall uh, continue to do and indeed expand uh, uh, in doing, uh, is, is to function as a kind of organizing nucleus in, in a uh, growing and uh, growing urban, uh, rapidly growing urban community. But Mumford says that's not enough to reorganize its uh, facilities on a regional basis, but it must undergo an inner transformation from science to wisdom, from detachment to commitment. Out of this will spring a new system of learning, a new attitude toward every manifestation of life, as different as the science and technology founded by Galileo, Bacon, and Descartes, Descartes and Newton, as they were from the theology of Thomas Aquinas. Without this great instauration, our plans for city development will remain sterile and superficial. Another aspect of the city that uh, we're all, of course, modern city in America that we're all acutely aware of is the growth of satellite communities. This is not exclusively a concern, certainly, of us. It's pa apparent around the country, and the effects are evident everywhere that it, uh, the rise of the satellite communities is accompanied by the de decay and disintegration of the core city, as we uh, sometimes call it, by the center of the old city, by its disruption or its slow, its so slow strangulation. How close people are to each other and what conditions, under what conditions they encounter or fail to account, encounter each other, of course, affects their attitude toward all uh, areas of life. And here, a quote from de Tocqueville is perhaps uh, quite uh, relevant. Uh, he wrote in eight, the 1830s, the first thing that strikes observation is the unaccountable number of men, all equal and alike, incessantly endeavoring to produce the petty and paltry pleasures with which they glut their lives. Each of them living apart is a stranger to the fate of all the rest. His children and his private friends constitute to him the whole of mankind. As for the rest of his fellow citizens, he is close to them, but he sees them not. He touches them, but he feels them not. He exists but in himself and for himself alone. I would suggest that this is a rather frightening uh, picture of the loneliness and sense of anomie in the great city or suburb, the sense of, of alienation, a sense of a loss of the warmth and support uh, of the true uh, community. The city is a great collective, and man, as Martin Buber points out, has always been at his most human as member of a, of a community, a genuine community. What does the modern city do to this sense of community? We've already noted that it has been preserved in the ghetto, 
but the disappearance of the ghetto and the absorption of its members into a wider, impersonal, atomized life of the city uh, has uh, changed that in, in uh, our cities or changed the character of the ghetto uh, very, very uh, markedly and dramatically. I would say that this also distorts other uh, relationships uh, the relationships in the family and relationships between the sexes. Uh, man certainly lives in a kind of delicate balance between the various aspects of his social and private life. And if one of these is drawn out of shape, if he does not find fulfillment in a genuine community, he asks more perhaps than he should from a family or expects more or finds his the the sensitive balance of his relationships with uh, relationship with his wife uh, distorted or uh, thrown out of focus. If we had time, we could say a good deal, I think, about the effect of the city on the sexual life of man. It seems to have bred bro both prudery and licentiousness, perhaps one as the complement uh, of the other. Uh, Victorianism uh, was a manifestation of an urban uh, middle class, uh, uneasy uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, inadequate in dealing with, with uh, problems of sex. Uh, companionate marriage was uh, primarily an urban solution of the, of the uh, or attempted a solution of the relationship between the sexes. Well, these particular negative aspects of the city are perhaps summed up in Mumford's somber phrases. The metropolitan world is a world where flesh and blood are less real than paper and ink and celluloid. I would say it seems to me that here the newspaper, which is such a ubiquitous part of the urban scene, uh, works very well uh, to this end. Uh, we read every morning some grisly horror, somebody dismembered or murdered or raped or somehow uh, dis, uh, uh, chopped to pieces, ground up in an automobile accident. Uh, we drink, read that quite casually as we drink our orange juice and have our soft boiled egg. And uh, it, uh, I think, serves in its cumulative effect to dehumanize us, to divorce us from the, uh, from, uh, the world of, of real experience. It is a world where great masses of the people, unable to achieve a more full-bodied and satisfying means of living, take like life vicariously as readers, spectators, listeners, passive observers. Living thus year in and year out at second hand, remote from the nature that is outside them, no less than remote from that uh, which is within them, it is no wonder that they turn more and more of the functions of life, even thought itself, to the machines that their inventors have created. Human beings are progressively reduced to a bundle of reflexes without self-starting impulses or autonomous goals. Behaviorist man. This is, the, this is the unhappy image that torments uh, Lewis Mumford when he looks at, at uh, many of the aspects of the city uh, in our age. Howard Moody, in a recent article entitled The City, Necropolis, or New Jerusalem, touches on both the positive and negative aspects of the city. It ought to be understood, he writes, by those who plan cities, those who govern them, and those who live in them, that a city may be destroyed by the push of a button, but it may also die from soul rot, which is worse. A city may die when it no longer creates civilized men, when it destroys the diversity in humanity in the humanity that occupies it, and when it debilitates the dialogue that makes for true drama. Drama lives in the community, lives and flourishes in the community. It is lost in the collectivity, I would suggest, that the that uh, we need always drama to draw, uh, to, uh, draw ourselves, draw us into life. You see, the play, as opposed to the newspaper, convinces us that we are indeed involved in those uh, people who act uh, before us on the stage. And in so doing, uh, it, uh, it humanizes us. And the loss of a sense of drama in our society is one of its most serious deficiencies and is not I'm sure unrelated to the uh, problem of the city. A city is dying when it has an eye for real estate values, but no heart for personal values. When it has an understanding of traffic flow, but no concern for the flow of human beings. 
when we have competence in building but little, little time for ethical codes. Well, the city has always drawn men's minds like a lodestar. It's only my function tonight to suggest, to, to give us this running start that Mumford has suggested was essential if we were to uh, enter uh, with any understanding into the life of the city. It has beckoned man on with the noblest dreams and visions of which he is capable and has often given him a hard and cruel reality. Cities have been both the incubators and the graveyards of the, of the civilizations that contain them and which they have shaped definitively. The challenge of the urban age, which is to me the most profound challenge that confronts the race, is to restore man's humanity, to turn jungles of glass and mortar and brick into genuine communities, that will support and exalt the soul of man and offer him the hope of that undying vision, and the vision of the eternal city. Thank you. I have first an announcement uh, there is an urgent message for Colonel Fred Case, who is asked to step out to the hall where Ms. Frances Ingalls, who is the head of the Department of Public Lectures, uh, has this message for him. Uh, she's standing at the exit to my left out there. Uh, first, I want to point out that after a brief period of questions. Uh, the same Miss Ingalls will be presiding over coffee in the hall, where I hope that we can carry on questions more informally. Uh, with this broad and, I think, elegant survey of what Professor Smith calls the ambiguous heritage of urbanism through the centuries, I know you'll agree with me that the series is well begun. And like all of Mr. Smith's lectures, this one suggests serious questions which I think one would wish to explore with him. Most obviously, he refers to the ambiguity, the ambivalence about the city which has been felt through the ages. The city, it's said, is civilization, is synonymous with civilization, and yet on the other hand, uh, the city has been viewed frequently and continues to be viewed as the puddle and sink of all iniquity. I myself would question some of Mr. Smith's dour and, as it seems to me, unduly pessimistic judgments on the quality of life in great American cities today. But, of course, it's not my place to challenge our speakers. Uh, that's your place. And it's part of the design of the series that you should have the opportunity to, to raise questions. Uh, Mr. Smith has agreed to entertain questions if you have any such. So I turn him over to you, or you over to him, as the case may be. Well, I would only say parenthetically that I didn't, I don't feel that I have an excessively gloomy or morbid view of city life because it's where we all live, and uh, I just think that uh, we, we do well to regard the various aspects of it. We. We have the Chamber of Commerce and various agencies who are congratulating us all the time on being the biggest and the most and the best and the smartest and all kinds of things, but this isn't going to save us. You know, I mean, it's very nice, but it's irrelevant. <laughs> no question. Well, they're stunned. <laughs> no, no. Where are they? I'm, I'm not going to argue. You better not. <laughs> Yes, I use them again rather in the, in the sense that Martin Buber uses them. A community is made up of a group of people who, uh, in its simplest form, who have face-to-face -face relationships, uh, although this can be extended considerably, I would say. I mean, the, the heart of a community, uh, we can't rule out any, any 
group, social group, that's too large for all the members to have face-to-face -face relationships. But this is an important aspect of community life, I would say. And then I would uh, say also the ideal community is uh, in the ideal community. People uh, have many contacts vertically. Uh, we're, we're in collective uh, arrangements or pseudo-communities. We are usually confined to one segment, one level of, of the community, our relationships, and there we have face-to-face -face contacts to be sure, professional uh, or whatever. Uh, I think the, the uh, collectivity is, uh, is the collection of uh, rather atomized individuals who don't form a, uh, an organic or, or uh, effective community who are grouped together uh, helter-skelter, hit or miss. They're, they, they're there because they, they uh, have, have landed there uh, for certain uh, reasons that have nothing to do with their fitting into any kind of, of uh, existing community organization. The suburb, of course, is a very good example of this. Uh, you even are inclined, perhaps, to protect yourself against knowing your next door a neighbor too well because that already involves you in some kinds of commitments and, and intimacies that you may not want to encourage. My next door neighbors are right here, uh, so, or my former next door neighbors, so I, I wanted to encourage that. <laughs> but uh, I do think that, that uh, I don't have a dictionary definition of a collectivity as, as opposed to a community, but I think we can all relate these two words to our own experience. We've all been members of communities. We've all been members of collectives, that is, we've been part of organizations in which we were uh, relatively anonymous. We were just, just part of an aggregate and had no clearly defined role and no relationship, clearly defined relationship to other members of the, of the uh, social group. Yes, sir. Yeah. Very greatly, very greatly. And I think this is something that will soon be changed. We see a kind of breakup of this, of this uh, ice jam or whatever you want to call it. And I think that when this happens, there will be at least much greater opportunities. Whether the cities will meet these opportunities resourcefully or not remains to be seen. And of course, it should be said at the same time that the effect uh, the in inhibitions of the uh, rural community imposed on the city's effective dealing with its problems, its most critical problems, is, uh, is only apparent on the state level. There's still a great deal that municipalities can do uh, quite independent of rural areas to make uh, the cities uh, better places in which to live. I think there is a tendency you see everywhere today to flee from the city, to shirk the responsibility. The city is abandoned. In many instances, the core of the city is abandoned to uh, the Negro community. Uh, it's, it's given up and people flee to the suburbs, and so you get a, a, an aggravation of, of all kinds of urban problems uh, by uh, leaving the city to a depressed minority group. This is certainly one of the most dangerous and, and uh, depressing problems that the city uh, has to face, and I don't see any in, in, uh, indication that we've hit on any way to reverse this process or to change it. I do think this is true, that I think there is a change in attitude. There was a rejection of the city that was quite clear after World War II and a mass exodus, and I'm told by some uh, planners and people close to to city management uh, problems that now there's somewhat of a return to the city. The city has, of course, uh, so many uh, advantages, so many, uh, the whole urbane, civilized, these are all, these are all derived from the city and, and the, the uh, highest life, as I try to suggest in my lecture, which sounded so gloomy to Mr. Berwick, has been lived in, in cities and should be and must be in the future. I mean, the cities, this is something that there's no retreat from. We can't retire to small towns or farms. 
Uh, and if we retire to suburbs, we perhaps condemn the cities just as much as if we went back to the old hometown, because uh, uh, the suburbs can't live, or the satellite communities can't live without the city, at least in any richness. 